Okay, quick introduction. Hey everyone, my name is Bjorn and I have the pleasure to give you a quick introduction um, into two of our technologies that we've been working heavily on over the last couple of years, uh, namely Substrate and Polkadot, and um, how we believe we can really supercharge innovation in our space with these technologies. So um, Parity Technologies was founded roughly three and a half years ago in London and um, um, was founded by a very small team of um, key engineers and a few key people from the Ethereum Foundation, most notably Gavin Wood and Jutta Steiner. Um, and we've really come a long way since being the small team to today where we are a team of 80 people, um, um, including some of some of the leading experts in, in certain very critical areas of uh, the blockchain development process. So, for example, peer-to-peer -peer networking. Another example is consensus. And last but not least, the Rust programming language. Um, I believe we, by, by implementing some very critical infrastructure for different um, blockchain networks, um, ecosystems such as Ethereum, Bitcoin, and Zcash, we have um, today become one of the most widely recognized infrastructure player in the in, in this space. And um, to walk you through a bit of my agenda for today, um, as I said, I mostly want to talk about Substrate and Polkadot and how it supercharges innovation in the space. Um, and I want to start off with a bit of the motivation. Like, why, why, have we, why do we bother building what we're building right now? So basically, if you want to use blockchain to power your application, you basically are left with two choices, mainly. Either you build your application on a general purpose smart contract platform, for example, think Ethereum, right, or Tezos. Um, the other option is build your own app-specific blockchain. And um, what I mean by that is think about Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin was built mainly for one purpose, right, to be an electronic cash system that can hold coins of users, right, and allow users to transfer them from A to B. Pretty straightforward, single purpose. Whereas Ethereum really was, was meant to be more of an application platform to um, really reinvent how you transact, how you build certain applications, how you create new uh, functionality for users. But, and I think this um, model of implementing new decentralized application of smart contract platforms uh, has, been, has been really tested out over the last few years extensively, right? Whereas um, this notion of app-specific blockchains hasn't really been a thing. And um, that is strange enough because there is a really good case for app-specific blockchains. So I, I brought a few, of argu a few arguments here um, that, that point out the merits of app-specific blockchains, being, for example, performance. The virtual machine of a blockchain, a general um, purpose smart contract blockchain, is often the bottleneck, right? And if you only have a single app in mind when you design your blockchain, you can really optimize the state machine. You can really optimize and then achieve way better uh, performance. Another one is security, right? Um, general purpose virtual machines of um, smart contract platforms have a very large attack surface due to its complexity. Again, if you only provide the functionality that your application users need, right, you can reduce this attack surface. Then there's sovereignty, right? If you only have to cater for your specific user base, um, you, you can be independent of um, all the obstacles that can surface from um, having to share a platform with many other applications, many other use cases, right? And um, this platform governance aspect, the, the hurdles and the obstacles, we can really experience right now in the Ethereum ecosystem, for example. And last but not least, right, if you are not bound to the, the platform's restrictions, right, you get a, you get a lot more flexibility to uh, design, for example, um, a high-frequency trading engine on top of a blockchain, which would be currently unthinkable of general purpose smart contract blockchains. Now, so the question is why hasn't that been done more over the past few years? Build layer one application-specific blockchains. Well, one reason is that building a blockchain from scratch is actually really, really hard and expensive. It takes loads of time. But 
At Parity Technologies, over the past few years, we have done it a, a, a few times, actually four times. We've started out with the Parity Ethereum client that most of you probably know. We've uh, done a Bitcoin implementation. Um, the black, black spot there is supposed to be a Zcash implementation, right, that we've been working on with uh, um, Zcash Foundation over the last half year, and which will be the first alternative implementation to the one provided by the Zcash company. And last but not least, we are building Polkadot. Right? And when we started building Polkadot two years ago, we were really like, oh my god, we're doing that for the first time now, right? Implementing a blockchain from scratch. And what we've seen is that 70 or 80% of the work is, feels almost redundant. There are loads of parts of a blockchain implementation that uh, don't um, differ substantially between these different systems, right? So, and that really told us, hey, we want other people to be able to stand off the shoulder of giants, right? We want to make these parts that we, every time we implement to make it reusable. And that's why we set out to build Substrate. And Substrate is fundamentally an open source, modular, very extensible framework for building blockchains. And as such, it provides you um, with a lot of components, and we designed it to be as generic as possible meaning that we try to remove any opinionation, right, um, to facilitate the best developability. And second, we try to make it too easy to build with as possible. And um, due to that, we made it modular. And by modular, I mean you have different level of, of abstractions in that um, system, right, going from very abstract on the right side which is a part of the framework we call substrate core, to being more opinionated on the left side, being more concrete and easier to develop with as uh, substrate, as ML, and substrate node, which I will talk a bit more about it in a minute. So substrate, what, what does it provide you with? Basically, it provides you with all the core components that a blockchain client needs. A database layer, a networking layer, consensus engines, transaction queue, and um, a library of runtime modules. And fundamentally, each of these ones can, again, be customized and extended, and thereby like really supporting the whole ecosystem and then enabling innovation. Now, there's a diagram that makes it a bit more visual, um, what Substrate is, right? On the outside, you have these, these elements that every blockchain client needs. You know, remote procedure call implementation. You need a sync mechanism. You need a networking library. In our case, that's uh, the Rust lib P2P uh, implementation. You need a database that's really optimized for storing Merkle trees, for example, right? And then you have this, this fabric that holds the whole blockchain together, which is a consensus engine. And inside it, you have an execution environment that is defined in WebAssembly. Um, that contains the runtime. And the runtime is critically that part of your blockchain uh, that defines what functionality um, the blockchain exposes to its users and developers, right? Think in Bitcoin, you know, it's holding, uh, holding coins and moving them from A to B, um, whereas in, in Ethereum, it's providing a smart contract platform. And in the concept or in the context of Substrate, the runtime we call is the block execution logic of the blockchain. And because a blockchain is a state machine fundamentally, right, you may call it state transition function. And there's a diagram of, um, that, that shows you what a runtime can contain, for example, right? It can contain a treasury. It could contain um, um, uh, certain balances, uh, certain other modules, certain other functionality you want to expose to your uh, users. And again, within this runtime, which really defines the business logic of your chain, right, um, we try to make it um, uh, very modular and very easily extensible. And that's why we created something we call the Substrate Runtime Module Library. And this is really kind of a, a box, you can imagine, that has loads of these modules in, and you just pick and choose and take them outside, put them together, and put them together to runtime, and that creates your blockchain. You're done. And some of these modules that we have already created, here you see an overview, are incredibly interesting. Treasury, for example, is, um, follows a bit of the concept of um, DAOs in Ethereum, right? Um, then you have uh, something like 
balances. Balances is a, a basic cryptocurrency that uh, provides you with accounts, provides you with certain locking mechanisms. Um, you have um, other things such as um, governance modules, such as democracy, right, that um, um, empowers your blockchain to have government around um, referendas and elections. And Substrate, but that's not only what Substrate provides you with. It also provides you with some really next generation, really cutting edge features. Um, notably, one is hot upgradable, pluggable runtime. So what does that mean? That basically means a system, a blockchain system, a network can upgrade itself without forking. You get forkless upgrades, which is, uh, in my opinion, a really big deal in, in today's um, in today's space. Other um, features that I think are notab not notable um, are hot swappable, pluggable consensus. That means in the future, um, when you've built your blockchain on substrate, right, the, the, the network can upgrade itself to a new consensus engine. Or uh, another one is off-chain workers oracles, which basically means you can have certain participants in the network um, execute logic off-chain and then provide data back in as an oracle. And we have a really tight integration for that, um, which will make it fundamentally extremely easy to um, realize certain uh, systems that weren't easily developable today. Um, yeah, but so when we talked about, um, when I talked about, uh, when I questioned why um, app-specific blockchains weren't a thing yet over the past few years, I, I mentioned and I uh, told you pretty much how we believe Substrate will make it at least an order of magnitude easier to build application-specific blockchains. Just remove the engineering effort that's required today. But there's another reason why th those haven't been a thing. And um, the reason are network effect, right? So how do you make sure that when you now implement your application-specific your own blockchain that you don't end up in an isolated walled garden again, right? With only your user base. Um, that is problematic from two perspectives. Number one, in, in today's you know, proof of work, proof of stake world, um, the security of your chain is really determined by the economic interest in your blockchain, right? And if you don't share your blockchain with many other applications, right? Um, the thing that defines the security of your application is only the interest in your application, and that's problematic, right? And this is really where Polkadot comes into play. Because Polkadot is the counterpart of Substrate that, is, that provides it with a network interface, right? To ensure that these innovative app-specific blockchains that are being created don't suffer from the network effects of the incumbents, right? But rather prosper from being interoperable from being able to talk to all these other blockchains and being able to, to trade and exchange information. And Polkadot fundamentally provides all these application-specific blockchains with two things. One is um, the ability to communicate with each other. And when I talk about communication, I really mean arbitrary message calls. So any kind of data um, message from one chain to another. You could have arbitrary contract calls, right, from one chain to another. And that's a really big deal by, by itself. But the other fundamental part is that Polkadot can be seen as um, um, security as a service, right? If you want to, if you have built your application-specific blockchain and you want to be become part of the Polkadot network, what it provides you with with a validation service. So it takes care that whatever your logic is of your chain is being secured by the entire Polkadot network, right? So we pool security over all these application-specific chains, all these user bases, all this economic interest in all these applications. Now, when we look at a diagram, right, that a Venn diagram that um, shows you all future Polkadot chains, all constituent chains in the Polkadot network, on the left side and on the right side, all chains that are being built, the framework substrate, um, we see a certain overlap. On the left side, you have parachains um, that are connected to Polkadot that are not being built with substrate. And there will be many of them probably. On the right side, you see um, the counterpart, right? Substrate-based chains that are not part of Polkadot, but rather independent. 
Think, for example, consortia chains, right? Being, being built by a conglomerate of enterprises um, and so forth. And in the middle, you have this overlap of parachains, so chains that are native to Polkadot that are being built with the framework substrate which can be seen as a software development kit for building Polkadot chains. Now, one thing that I, I want to point out is that Polkadot really doesn't want to compete with other next generation chains. So what we believe has really hindered the innovation process in our space, especially with regard to uh, layer one technologies, is uh, chain maximalism, right? So outside ignorance combined with these economic exclusivity results in chain maximalism, which could be seen as a peer-to-peer -peer equivalent with, of uh, nationalism, right? And that's really, really bad for innovation. So what we rather want to see uh, is, um, is a system that provides us the world with um, the, um, the ability, right, to create blockchains that can coexist and complement each other, right? And we believe that providing such a tool could overcome our current state of having chain maximalism. Now, uh, let's have a look at the state of chains that can be built with substrate. Again, you can have solo chains, right? You can build your own chain with your own um, network, with your own consensus, right? Your own validators and so forth. Um, but when Polkadot has launched, you can determine maybe, you know, I want to come a bit closer um, to Polkadot. I want to uh, make use of the network effects that I gain from being able to talk to all these other chains. And you build a bridge, right? You still um, keep sovereignty over your own network, but you're able to communicate with all these other chains. And then if you go the full rate to the right side here, you become a parachain, which means you give up coming to consensus on your own in your network, but rather taking this security as a service offering from Polkadot. Now, let's have a quick look of um, what can be built with Substrate, right? I brought you a few examples. For example, we as a company, Parity, we are using Substrate to build an Ethereum 2.0 client, right? In that instance, from the substrate framework, what we use is the abstraction level substrate core. That means the only thing that we currently build on top of substrate to get to an Ethereum 2.0 client is a runtime, right? And that means that 80% of the work, roughly, has already been taken care of substrate, right? That means you only need 20% of the engineering efforts to build an Ethereum 2.0 client compared to um, starting from scratch. Um, another thing that's being built or, or that's being looked into building is um, some of you might be familiar with the um, DAO startup called Aragon, right? And they are planning to building a decentralized organization network, Aragon OS, on Substrate and connecting it to Polkadot, making it available to all these other application-specific chains. Governance as a service in this context, right? And the great thing is by um, not being limited by... Um, um, the capabilities, right, by the design space of um, smart contracts platforms. They can, for example, in the substrate contracts, just remove the notion of gas, right, have fixed fee transactions, and actually only expose to its users what is deemed a feature. Um, Commonwealth is another example. Commonwealth is a, a startup that is building a self-improving smart contract platform. Um, a blockchain with substrate, um, that's trying to be as transparent and open as possible, right? And having very, um, very concrete on-chain governance in that uh, instance. They are actually, I believe, set to launch in the next couple of months, so I would keep an eye on them. That, that will be a very interesting um, example. So there are a few other examples that we have built or the community have built. In fact, we had... Um, our first Substrate Developer Conference a month ago in Berlin um, with roughly 30 teams, um, a pretty small event with 70 to 100 people where we in had an invite-only event for only builders, right? And it was an incredibly flourishing, flourishing um, ecosystem. And I'm, I'm very excited to see what's coming out in the next few months. So if you want to learn Substrate, right? Uh, multiple ways you can do that. One example is 
you can do the substrate game tutorial that Gavin presented at Web3 by going to the link that I um, put on the slide there. And what he did is basically he coded a blockchain from scratch, a pretty simple game, but still an entire blockchain from scratch in a live demo, or in a live demo on a newly unwrapped MacBook Pro live on stage. Um, we have a few other tutorials that are very interesting. One is, for example, a token created registry that um, one of my colleagues implemented on Substrate. Another one is that we presented at our um, at Subzero, our Substrate Developer Conference, is we implemented a UTXO chain. So something that's really fundamentally different to all these other things that have been mentioned before. Um, and one of the absolute favorite tutorials that are out there is the Substrate Collectibles games. So think, for example, CryptoKitties, right? Or non-fungible tokens. There's an implementation and a great tutorial that you can follow through and learn all the ins and outs of Substrate of this framework. So the question is just like, what will you or your team build with Substrate, right? There are two starting steps. Get started at the developer hub. Um, we are putting tremendous efforts over the next month into really building out uh, this documentation, potentially building a playground where you can um, um, play around with Substrate in an in-browser setting uh, and a few other things. I really encourage you that um, if you get started, get in touch with us. If you follow that link, you will join our Riot Chat with our core developers that are um, super helpful usually in answering all sorts of questions. Um, another thing that I would like to point out, um, we will have the second series of the Web3 Summit in August in Berlin, happening in the amazing venue Funkhaus. Um, I think it's one of the only events, blockchain layer one technical events, that um, really bring together all these fundamentally different technologies that we've seen out there, be it um, um, Tezos, Ethereum, be it Polkadot, and bring them to a table and talk tech. Um, last but not least, we as a company, Parity Technologies, as well as the larger substrate ecosystem are hiring, right? You can follow these two links to find jobs at our companies or uh, subscribe to newsletter that will inform you about jobs that are being offered um, at companies that are utilizing substrate today. Now, if you have any follow-up questions, if you want to dive a bit deeper into the technology, if you want to learn a bit more about our companies or how we can perhaps like, support you in your mission to build a great application, just reach out to me, uh, shoot me an email, ping me on Twitter, it doesn't matter. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Uh, so, yeah, basically, like, well, I want to know, like, for Polkadot, uh, how could you make sure, like, there's actual some chain is using Polkadot and do cross-chain transaction, uh, especially for Bitcoin and Ethereum? Um, I don't know, like, I, I never observed they are working on anything to support Polkadot. How could you make sure, like, uh, you can talk to Bitcoin and Ethereum? Yeah, thanks. <coughs> so, if I understood you correctly, you are asking, um, if Polkadot doesn't care about Polkadot, how do we make sure that all the constituent chains in Polkadot can, you know, interoperate or make use of Bitcoin? That's a very good question. So basically, uh, that's one of the reasons why we build a Bitcoin implementation, right? We implement a production-ready implementation in Rust of the Bitcoin protocol. And what we, we are set out to build are bridges, right? And bridges are basically constituent chains in the Polkadot network that you know, facilitate this information exchange between Bitcoin and Polkadot, right? And um, it's still a bit early to talk about the, um, um, the technical details, how this transfer will work. And there are certain things that would make it fundamentally easier for us to implement that on the Bitcoin side. For example, Schnorr signatures that may or may not be included in, in, in Bitcoin. Um, but we are fairly optimistic that we can make that work. On, uh, with regard to Ethereum, right, uh, to 
you know, connect Ethereum, the Ethereum mainnet to Polkadot and all its constituent chains, we have a lot more clarity of how that will work and how we can make that work. But basically, if these chains don't do, you know, these kind of chains that we are very interested in, um, don't take the effort to become part of Polkadot or build the bridges themselves, um, we or other players in the ecosystem will basically build it. And the Web3 Foundation, who is kind of the chip heart of the uh, Polkadot um, network and Polkadot ecosystem, has put out grants and is working together with uh, an tr over 20 um, head uh, researcher team to work on exactly that, for example, and other teams to implement that. Hello? Yeah. So, <laughs> sorry, let me repeat. Um, so do you mean that like, as long as a, a chain that we can rewrite a, a client using Rust and using the substrate framework and you will be able to talk to Polkadot? And this is exactly what I mean. So okay, cool. substrate is incredibly powerful because of two things. Number one, as I said, it takes away 80% of the work that you usually have to do to implement your blockchain client. And the other thing is, if you build on substrate, like you're pretty much guaranteed that it can become part of Polkadot, right? For us, it's two things. It's a software development kit for um, solo chains, so for chains that can be independent. But at the same time, if you build it on Substrate, we will provide you at Polkadot launch with uh, some, a library called Cumulus, right? That makes sure that you can transform it into a Polkadot chain, right? So it's going to be interoperable by design with Polkadot. And the, the amazing thing is that basically means um, if you already plan with becoming part of the Polkadot system, you don't have to wait until Polkadot gets launched, right? You can build your chain on Substrate today. You can even launch it and test it. You can um, launch it as a proof of authority network, for example. You could launch it as a proof of stake system. And then later, because of the on-chain governance, on-chain upgradability function, you could have your community have a vote and say like, oh, actually flip a switch and now we will be uh, part of the Polkadot network and being secured by the Polkadot network. That's what we are trying to do. Any other questions? I can repeat it as well. Depends a bit what we're talking about. So if you um, if you dis if you implement your um, blockchain right on substrate, no, it, then it's fine, right? Then it's being taken care of, right? It just works. Now I think your question was like, what happens if Ethereum upgrades, for example? We have built this bridge, right, with the current functionality. What happens if it upgrades? Wait, we are the people that have to implement the change in Ethereum, right? Parity Ethereum is probably the no is the most used. Um, uh, client implementation uh, beneath minus, right? So if it's not being implemented in PSG Ethereum, currently it wouldn't happen, right? The system wouldn't upgrade, right? And we know um, since we will implement these changes probably in Parity Ethereum, it will be uh, straightforward for us to implement any changes needed on the bridge side. Same counts for obviously Bitcoin and Zcash. But yeah, fundamentally, there's obviously we can't give a guarantee for that for the next 10 years it will be interoperable because it could also be that the Bitcoin network decide, determines from today to tomorrow that they want to be a smart contract platform after all, which is very unlikely, but you never know, right? Yes, please. Basically, is there is this a discovery system in place right now? If I build application on this right now, how do I find other blockchains built on the same technology? And how do I limit what other blockchains can talk to my blockchain? Or do I have no choice in the matter? Can anybody communicate with my blockchain if they're built on the same technology as mine? Or can I have like a list, I guess a peer list, of other blockchains that I want my blockchain to communicate with and have the interpool be between? Or is that out of my hands? Can anybody uh, communicate with my blockchain using this? Uh, could you could you please rephrase your your question and uh, 
I couldn't if, follow. If there are multiple blockchains built on the same, on this technology. On substrate. They, yes, substrate. Do they have uh, a choice in the matter if they're able to be transacted with somebody else's application built on the same uh, technology? If I don't want my blockchain to be uh, transacted between somebody else built on substrate, can I limit that? And can I also limit, uh, there's also a discovery system involved as well. Can I discover other blockchains built on substrate as well, or, or is that not in place yet? So uh, there's a, um, a one thing, we have to talk about one, one thing first. Um, and that is, um, Substrate is a technology framework, right? That allows you to build in, um, an implementation of a blockchain, right? So that by itself is just like a piece of software that doesn't say anything about what the network will be yet, right? Or who will be part of the network. Now, if, um, so your question was like, if multiple applications use Substrate to build their blockchain, right? Um, do you have any means to prevent them from talking to each other? Well, to mine specifically, if I only want a, a certain list of those applications or blockchains uh, communicating with my blockchain, is there a way to limit who I can, or who my blockchain has access to? And who of course, yeah. So, okay, so the question is about permissioning, right? Can I, can I build a permissioned blockchain? Can I introduce permissions on different levels of the blockchain? Absolutely, right? So we, um, we had actually implemented that already in Parity Ethereum, and based on the learnings that we've taken from there, we implemented Substrate in a way where you can customize all these different layers. So for example, you can have permissioning on, on a networking layer, right? Where it says like, oh, the nodes can only connect to this network topology where these participants are there. You can introduce permissions on a um, transaction level, right? Where it says like, only these accounts can do certain interactions within the network, right? So you're completely free to introduce these restrictions in, in multiple levels, and we will make it, or it is already fairly easy to do that. And what about the discovery uh, tool to help other substrate applications find each other? Find each other, so uh, that's what Polkadot takes care of, right? Like, if you've built your substrate, um, a, a blockchain based on substrate, right, um, and launch it as an independent chain, right, there's nothing um, uh, that gives you, um, per se, discoverability towards other applications, right? But that's where Polkadot comes into play, because once you connect to Polkadot, um, you, you, you probably have a register, right, that, uh, that informs your blockchain or your application about all these other applications that are available in Polkadot, or these other parrot chains that are connected to it, right? So that, that provides you with discoverability. I think we got to wrap up. Last question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, um, who runs the nodes in this Polkadot network? I did. I understand there is a chain in that Polkadot network. That's so, who who runs the nodes? And how many nodes are there? Okay. That. So um, basically. Um, I would recommend listening to the next talk because um, Robert Habermeyer is going to talk about consensus and substrate chains, and I bet he's going to um, uh, touch on Polkadot as well, consensus. Basically, it's a proof of stake chain, right, with many unpermissioned validators. We believe it's going to be hundreds to thousands of validators um, um, that can produce blocks and finalize transactions, and um, they're going to be randomly chosen, right? So. That's, ba that's a basic mechanism. It's public, yeah, of course. A public unpermissioned chain, fundamentally Polkadot, right? That um, doesn't make any assumptions over what that is they actually secure, right? Like whatever people build on Substrate and connect to Polkadot. That's why it's security as a service. Thank you very much. <laughs>